this session today, I just wanted to share this to put it into like the greater context of things. But here we're really wanting to focus in on um, education and living wages and local wealth through a life course um, framework and thinking about um, how we can support children, youth, and families from early childhood and beyond, cradle to career. So, um, you know, the question is, how can we support them? And this image here just shows the life course um, from, you know, healthy babies, early childhood, K to eight, high school, career readiness, and has some uh, different indicators there, um, which we'll be talking a little bit about, um, mostly on the early childhood side, and then a little bit on the, the employment and uh, economic side. And before I introduce our panelists, I just wanted to share our objectives. So we're gonna unpack meeting, meanings of cradle to career and its relationship to mental well-being, describe how challenges related to education, living wages, and local wealth are arising in communities and what their impact is on early childhood, and then discuss opportunities to support well-being, again, from early childhood and beyond. Um, by advancing educational and economic opportunities. Uh, so that's what we're going to get into today, and I want to start off by introducing our two panelists that we have in the front. Um, if you can't see us sitting in the front, please feel free to move up. Um, so we have Christy Serrano in the middle here, who is the Houston Regional Director of First Three Years. Um, prior to joining first three years, Christy worked in child abuse prevention, programming, early childhood policy, and education philanthropy. Christy also has experience working with teens with disabilities in developing job readiness skills. Christy's demonstrated her leadership abilities in positions across various advisory boards, committees, and mentorship roles. She holds a Bachelor of Arts in Political Science and Spanish from Northwestern University and a Master of Public Policy from the Harris School of Public Policy Studies uh, um, at the University of Chicago. Christy grew up in Fort Bend County and now lives in Harris County with her husband and three adorable pets. <laughs> I wish we got pictures. <laughs> <laughs> we also have uh, Margaret, Oser or Oser? Oser. Oser, um, who has 30 years of experience in nonprofit management, evaluation, and fundraising. Currently, Margaret is the Vice President of Mission and Strategy for the United Way of Greater Houston. Uh, she has spent the majority of her career within the United Way system in both Houston and San Antonio, Texas. During her time with United Way, she has led fundraising efforts in both corporate and governmental sectors, um, she's led the development and implementation of various community initiatives focused on resident engagement and financial stability. Uh, she serves as the lead evaluator for various programs and initiatives focused on asset-based community development, health, mental health, financial stability, substance abuse, character development, and basic needs. Margaret was fortunate to attend a two-year fellowship at Harvard's Kennedy School on Family Strengthening. Margaret is a graduate at, of the University of Texas at Austin and has committed her professional life to serving within the state of Texas. So let's give a round of applause for our panelists. So to start us off, um, I'd love to hear from each of you, uh, what does cradle to career mean to you? Where did this one come from? You brought that in. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for the introduction. Are we in morning still? Yes, we are. Um, so, cradle to career. So that has been kind of the collective impact buzz phrase, phrase du jour for about a while now. And I really think that it's meaningful, but I think in practice it's really hard to do. And I think I'm not shocking everybody in, in saying that we live in a very siloed and fragmented system of care for children and adults. So we have health over here, we have education over there, we have public, uh, um, yeah, public health initiatives that, that don't necessarily com, com, um, uh, complement our medical system, so our healthcare system. 
Um, we also have family and parenting type initiatives, and then we have substance abuse initiatives. So there's a lot of different things that all, if taken comprehensively, many families need, but they just exist in silos. So I think in Cradle to Career, the best laid plans attempt to connect these silos together. So they're integrated, they're aligned. Um, that works great in theory, and I think that we strive every day to better do that work, and it takes not just advocacy, but also lots of funding alignment and thinking about um, how do you help families navigate multiple systems seamlessly, um, and then and how do you take that to scale? And so from birth, um, having that comprehensive lens of every single program or system that family touches is thinking about how are we getting through not just you know doing this direct thing and staying in our lane but doing that work and then um, I think a lot of that means as in our day-to-day -day work thinking about transitions planful transitions from A to B and that again doesn't always work great in practice um, the Individuals with Disabilities Act has both Part C and Part B um, and those systems, even though they're created under the same program, you have children leaving ECI, uh, coming to school districts, and those transition planning doesn't always work so well. So we can do even with the little uh, integratedness that we have, you can we can do a better job at making more planful transitions that are children-centered, that are developmentally appropriate um, throughout the lifespan. Good morning. Good morning. So to us, it really means um, that we're not just focusing on the child because the child doesn't exist alone, right? right? They come in the ecosystem, whatever that family may be, there's a family surrounding them and that we have to support them as a whole. That if we only focus on the parent side, we're missing out on what we can do for the child. If we're only focusing on the child, we're missing out on what we can do for the parent or the guardian, or the custodian, or the great best friend who's taken on the children, whoever that family system is. And what we have seen in United Way, we're just guilty of it as anybody, we siloed everything to death. And we spent the last few years really looking at ourselves and what can we do to change that mindset. And so our focus going forward is really looking at the family as a whole and putting coaches in the center of that family. It's moving away from traditional case management that is crisis-based, it's let me tell you what to do with the best of intentions, and moving to more of a coach-based philosophy which comes from the theory that the individual has all the strengths and gifts that they need, they know exactly where they wanna go, and our role is to support them in that road. The other thing, that we're moving toward is breaking down these silos. We're not asking every organization to do everything, but we're looking forward to a time in the future, we can't say it's tomorrow, but a time where whatever you do best, you do best, but then you're connected to another organization that does the next step in that journey best. And we transition people easily. As Christy was talking about the transitions for children from ECI into, into elementary school is not as smooth as it should be, even though we have a system set up for them. So what can we do to provide that support for people moving forward? And that's what it means to us, that you're looking at the family as a whole and not stopping along that journey wherever they are and picking up and working with them moving forward. Thank you both. That's a great start for all of us here. Um, since I want to make this interactive, I uh, want to hear from all of you. Um, does anyone have anything they'd like to add or anything you'd like to say regarding what Cradle to Career might mean to you? What do you do um, to incorporate the families and the children interactive? <laughs> to engage the parents and the children. Because I know that there are some parents that have those resources and help them help their children. What do you do to incorporate resources to those families? Is this for both of us or is this for Margaret? Oh. Um, incorporate resources to help interaction. Yeah, to engage the families and help their children with things that they may not understand. Yeah, so coming at it from a birth to three perspective, so um, a lot of that is about as Margaret was mentioning, addressing family needs 
Uh, and we'll, I'm actually going to talk about this a little bit in, in a future slide about a paper that really lays this out really nicely. Um, but it is it's addressing any kind of stressors that a family has. So a lot of what we're also going to kind of touch on today is social determinants and some of these factors that are uh, um, are impacting mental health and emotional health outcomes. And if we, you know, the, the black box is that the biology of stress, so it's, it's not necessarily, you know, not, um, you know, there are safety concerns with, you know, not having stable housing and, and things like that. Um, but a lot of that is a lot of the bi physiological and neurobiological impact of, of what leads to poor health outcomes is, is actually tied to stress. And so when you lift that stress, and no matter what role you're playing, you're, you're creating space. Um, so that's the first thing to do. Before we try to change behaviors, before we try to teach, we sort of have to create space for that emotional connection. And then once you create that space for emotional connection, because you've removed, you know, you may not have eliminated the stress, but you're you're making it more tolerable. So, and then making, you know, because not all stress is bad. Some stress is actually really needed to promote resiliency, individual resiliency and community resiliency. But all that is grounded in relationships. And then when you create that space, then any sort of uh, intervention that you're working towards, whether it's you know more of that, uh, if, if you're in a therapist role, you know sort of that play therapy and following the child's lead and, and things like that, or if you're in the educator role, or if in your in a home visitor role, you're more able to connect with that family to give them the tools that they need to better interact with that child. But I think the first order condition is really about creating more space by reducing the stress, and that is hard. So. I think for us, we've worked for a long time in parent engagement and different ways to help uh, parents understand, particularly different developmental stages of children. Like we all know the stage where they go through where they flop on the floor and they're like a little, little and they can't move and they have a total freak out because you told them to put a dish in the sink. And But that's all part of normal developmental behavior and how you help parents understand that because if you're already stressed from worrying about the bills, worrying about work, worrying about how you're going to take care of everything, and then you got a child on the floor that's going limp and screaming at the top of their lungs, which the neighbors may be hearing and not too happy about, how do you help that parent understand what's happening and how to cope with it in a way that reduces the stress and doesn't add to their stress? I'm not going to say it's easy because they're already stretched, so finding the time to provide them with these little tips and tricks to help is difficult, but you try to weave it into the time that they have. So if it's after work, provide dinner. If it's um, in the morning, provide breakfast or do it before they have to go to work. It's how do you adjust what you do to fit in with what they're trying to accomplish during the day. But we don't have all the answers. We had one more comment in the back and then we're gonna keep going with our panel and hopefully we can come back to more questions uh, later on. Oh, there's a question. Yeah. Um, hi, I'm Victoria, we're for Meaningful Choice and we, my colleague and I actually are overseeing a program that there's a social determinants of health, one being early childhood education, the other one the icon and stability specifically through um, education for pathways. But my question <coughs> is, you hit on the family unit and we're really big on like, the family unit move to this coaching model because it's the coach that stays with them no matter what organization they're going to and they play the role of a cheerleader, a roadblock remover, um, motivator, re-motivating when it gets tough and understanding when they need to take a break because sometimes we want to move them a lot faster than they can or, or handle because when they're dealing with everything else you can only take so much change at one time and so the coach is there to support them through that journey. 
And I think it's something that it's missing the most in our very complicated social network that's out there to support people. There's not that link that stays with them no matter where they are. And so our hope is, not, we're not there yet, but our hope is to get those coaches embedded in as many nonprofits as we can that are in the social spectrum so that whenever someone walks into, they say they walk into agency A with XYZ issue, well they first meet with a coach so that coach is looking at everything, not just the issue they walked in with. They get that first one dealt with, but then they work with them on what's their pathway to the future. And they stick with them knowing people are gonna go off that path and they'll come back on when they're ready, but that coach is gonna be there for them when they're ready to come back on. They're also there to check in with them. How's it going? How are you doing? What can I do to support you, to get you to be moving forward? They're also about ensuring it's the person doing the work and they're not doing it for them. Because we all know it's so much nicer if somebody's doing it for us, but that only lasts us for so long. And if we're not doing the work, it's not gonna stick with us. So the coaching model, we believe, will help with that. But in the interim, the more you can get those agencies that you work with to really coordinate with each other, so that as they're moving from one to another, it's a warm handoff. They're expected, they know their name, they know they're coming in, so they're not starting from scratch each time they go to a different provider. The other thing I wanted to add was just thinking about policies too. How can we have policies that support these families in you know, their well-being? So it's not just on the individual family unit, but like what systems and supports can we have in our community environment that also um, support them in their success? Yeah, and the last thing I wanted to add is to, to Margaret's point of we do, you know, as service providers, you do have to meet certain things. You know, I know there's certain models, there's one called pathways, and that basically you have to check boxes all the way through. Once you complete a pathway, that means you've succeeded in, in addressing that risk factor. But sometimes families don't work that way. And so if you if you still need to do the things that you need to say because the grant says so or whatever it is that says so. I would try reframing it in the way that really um, is goal setting for the family of what they want to see and what they want to accomplish. And some of it may not fit nice and neat in the goals of your program, but um, if you're able to reframe it in a coaching way that it's their work, it's their, it's what they want. Um, and I, I, I find you know the word empowering is a little problematic in these in these settings because what you want to help point to or show is that the family already has the power within them that you're not giving you're not transferring you're like here's my power you can have it it's really helping them see that they already have it and not giving it to them so we're going to dig deeper into some of the challenges and assets and uh, Christy has been doing some work newly in Baytown and so I wanted to ask kind of get into a local perspective um, what are some of the challenges that families face when it comes to education and economics in Baytown and also what are some of the strengths in community when it comes to these factors I think I think often we focus on the challenges um, but don't also speak up about what the strengths are and there are so many strengths in our communities so just wanted to get you to uh, share a little bit about both of those yeah, and just for some context, um, we were fortunate to be one of the 10 communities. Um, first three years of the lead applicant, we were a convener. Um, the work, the person who's leading this work day to day, full time, is actually a Baytown resident. We'll, I won't point her out, because I don't want to embarrass her, but she's wonderful. Um, and so we are, were really mindful as lead applicant to um, think about a promotion lens of mental health and resiliency. So our vision for Baytown through this collaborative is to create a cross-sector, um, seamless, seamlessly connected system of care for children birth to three and their families. That's equitable and that is really reflective of what families want. Um, and so that's the work underway. And so um, if you're not familiar with the Communities of Care grant, you know, happy to talk more about that offline. But um, so what we know is that while Baytown, and if you're not familiar with Baytown, it's, it's a wonderful city. It's the second largest city in Harris County, about 30 miles east of here. Um, it closely mirrors the, the demographics of Houston. Um, however, we know that 
in Baytown. Baytown is home to a higher proportion of children under five and um, Hispanic residents. So there's just much, you know, at, when compared to the county as a whole, there's just many more children, which is something that I learned through the application process, which is interesting. Um, we also see higher income inequality com compared to the nation, um, so that's a national statistic. Um, and then also compared to Harris County, residents of Baytown are less likely to have health insurance and are more likely to live in poverty. And so there's a lot of, um, not to dwell on the needs, but there's a lot of opportunity to address these um, risk factors that we know really are uh, key drivers to outcomes for families in this work. Um, and But on the plus side, it is a vibrant community that I've been um, just so, so happy with the partners we have around the table. Uh, the nonprofit community is strong. Um, you know, we, re we recognize across the different sectors that there's always a need for services. Um, so we don't get hung up on that. We get hung, not hung up. We focus on what we can do together and just working towards the planning year in order to think about what our planning is. Uh, sorry, our action steps will be to make that more connected, despite the need for, we always need more specialists, we always need more um, pediatricians, we always need, uh, you know, there's always going to be a need, at least in, I think, the near future, but as long as we're doing it well with what we have. That being said, I think there's also work um, to be done in, in a, in a, and this is another really important element of the, the Communities of Care Grant, is to bring together families as decision makers. Um, not just the recipients of this work, of actual uh, taking into account what is needed. There was um, an Episcopal Health Foundation community assessment done in 2015. Um, something that they found was that even though there's many health and education uh, and as well as social services in, in within Baytown, um, community members cited not knowing about them. Um, that was one of their major takeaways from this um, this work. It was a, it was a assessment done in partnership with Legacy Community Health. And so that we found is a is a gap, but it's also really opportunity, a really neat opportunity to say, how can we better just communicate what is available and make that very um, obvious to families so again, they can start navigating the system themselves while we work to implement our plan. And uh, Margaret, for you, how do you see families' economic and educational challenges play out in the greater Houston area. I know that your work really spans across the, the greater Houston area. And again, same, what about the strengths as well? So before I get into that, I just want to put in a little uh, commercial for 211 Texas United Way Helpline. So if you don't know what it is, 24-7, 365 helpline to connect people to services. So if you, it's in Big Town, you know, because we cover Big Town. So please let people know about that. It helps them navigate the services. So in terms of the challenges and the strengths, I want to start with the strengths. Because I always think about it this way. When you look at our population in our area, over 40% in Harris County alone is not making enough to make ends meet. When you look at what it costs to live here and what people are making, over 40% are not making enough to make ends meet. I can guarantee you we're not serving all of those people because it's in the millions. But they are making it somehow, some way, and that talks to their strength and their resiliency to me. They find ways to make it from day to day, informal care for their children, a network of providers, family members, friends, neighbors. They've provide informal lending circles. You need money, we'll put together, help you out, you pay it back, and so forth. They find ways to do community gardens and do all the uh, parent caregiving. Most, many families these days are in a sandwich that parents are caring for as well as children. And that to me speaks to the strength of our families. And I don't think we give it enough credit because we're always asking them to do more. But what they are doing is quite remarkable. Um, the challenges that we face, let's go back to what people are earning. Um, over 62% of the jobs in the state of Texas pay $10 an hour or less. 62% pay $10 an hour or less. You cannot live on $10 
You have to make $15 an hour just to make $30,000 a year. What does it take to make it in Harris County alone? To pay your rent for a family of four with an infant and a toddler? It costs you $61,404. And that's just to make it from month to month. That's not savings, that's not vacations, that's not putting money away for your child's college, that's not any of that, that's just making it month to month. But you need to make $15 an hour to make $30,000. So you have to be in a two-parent household to just make it, or two-adult earning income household. Um, the other things to know in Texas is that the gender gap in wages is even more significant. And the lower, the lower the educational attainment, the bigger the gap is. So we all know the gender gap is there, but when you look at less than college, that gap gap widens even more. So if you've got a high school diploma, you're earning 60% less than men with the same educational attainment. Some of that has to do with the jobs that women tend to go into versus men. We're trying to break that down too. We've been doing some work on women in construction to get them into some of those higher wage jobs. Um, but other, it, there is just a gender gap. And we all need to acknowledge it and work to change it. And that's policies that can't change it, even though they're technically on the books. So I'm not going to get into a lecture on that. There are on the books, <laughs> but it's kind of hard to enforce when nobody talk. You're not allowed to talk about salary in the workplace. Um, some of the other things that we know um, in terms of what people are struggling with is the benefits cliff. Um, how many are y'all aware of the benefits cliff? So you could right now, if you are on TANF, you can get subsidized childcare, Medicaid for your children. Um, if you're a pregnant woman, you can get Medicaid for yourself um, and other supports. As you go up in income, there comes to a point where you make $1 over a certain amount, you lose everything. There's no ramp down. It's one day you're making this amount of money, Tomorrow you make a dollar more and you've just lost all of your benefits, but chances are you're still on a job that pays for your child care, that can cover your health care, and, and food SNAP and all of the other pieces that help families piece things together. The benefits cliff is real. A lot of families forego promotions and job elevation because it's not enough to cover the, the loss of benefits but then they're not moving forward, they're staying stagnant because of that. Um, and I think those are policies that can be put in place. You don't have to go from one day having all of this to the next day having nothing. There can be a ramp down based on income. Um, the, um, so we got really interested in what does it actually take for a family to make it? So for a long time, but nine years ago, the United Way of Northern New Jersey launched a project that they call ALICE, and that's um, Asset Limited, Income Constrained, Employed. And it was really a project to say, okay, we know people are struggling, but what does it really take for people to make it? Because we know the current poverty levels are a joke. They're based on something that came out of the 1950s when food was your most expensive, expensive budget item. as no nothing to do with current reality. So they wanted to really look at really what does it take. And they go county by county and they look at the costs in that county. So they're not doing nationwide averages. So you're not comparing New York and California to South Texas. When you're looking at South Texas, you're looking at what's the housing, housing costs there. What are the food costs there? And so you can look across all of Texas and see what are the costs within those areas. Harris County right now, as I said earlier, for a family of four, is 61,404. This is how that budget is made up. And these are not numbers they pulled out of the thin air. And rent came from HUD for the fair market rate for a family of four. And I don't know about y'all, but if you look for housing in Harris County lately, for a two or three bedroom house, it's costing you more than $948 a month. It's probably well over $1,000 a month. And that's not the high end. 
when you look at child care, that's a family, licensed family home with an infant and a toddler. Infants, we all know, is the most expo expensive child to care for, and the costs go down as they age. But in Texas, that's the highest cost most families are bearing, is their child care. Next is food. Who's tried to live on $525 a month for food lately? Exactly. So that's the thrifty plan from the USDA. And I, I encourage y'all to look at what that thrifty plan will buy for a family. It's not exactly what you call a well-balanced diet, nor is it something that really feeds the full family before for a month. Transportation, 771. Sorry to say, we live in an area you have to have a car. And this transportation is not just what it costs to have the car, but it's your insurance, it's your gas, it's the maintenance on your car, so you actually have a car that can get you to work. Healthcare, 704, it's a combination between if you have insurance or not, how many of y'all are paying? I would say the average monthly for a family on even your employer-sponsored Health care is over $700 a month, and that's a cheap one. Um, technology. Sorry to say, we're not in an age anymore where you can get away with not having access to the internet. So most families, the way they have access is through their smartphone. That's their main means of any type of communication. They have to have that. If you're looking for a job, if you don't have an email address, you can't get a job. Um, and then miscellaneous and taxes, 893, that's your cost overruns that I thought included utilities, but oh no, utilities is included in that 948 up there for monthly rent. So when you look at that budget, there's no frills in there, there's no, there's no fun. It's just making it from month to month. And that's for a family of four. This out, yes? What's the miscellaneous in taxes again? Is that, that's not income tax. So what is that 893, that's a big number. That includes sales tax, that includes any cost overruns, say your car breaks down, or you have a flat tire, or your child gets sick. All those extras that come every single month, that's in the miscellaneous. If you're more interested in this, I'm sorry, I'm gonna put a plug in. Um, we have the full report on the United Way of Greater Houston's website, and you can even break it down to zip code. So if you wanna really dig into an area you're working in to see what it is for your area, you can. All the data is there for you to manipulate however you want. We want this to be a change in the conversation, away from just those that are living in poverty, but all of those that are struggling, and particularly this gap population that's Alice, because it's the population there's the least available to them, and the ones that have the least resource that they can access. So we really want people to understand what this means and that it's not 15% of your population that's struggling, it's 40% or 50% depending on where you live. Yeah, this All right. is, no, that's, that's great. And I think this data is really helpful to hopefully everyone in this room to look at in more detail and really use to make the case for some of the work you're wanting to do in communities. Um, so thank you for sharing that. And I know we'll dive deeper into it a little bit as well. Um, but I do want to turn to Christy and kind of move us into connecting some of this conversation to early childhood development um, and why early childhood is such an important time period. So I wanted to ask you about that, Christy, and how you see economic and education issues like the ones that you've all kind of been bringing up um, earlier. How do they really impact uh, young children and families? Um, so I'm, I'm sure I'm preaching to the choir here, but um, so we know that the what happens in the first the experiences that you have in those first few years of life impact lifelong learning, health, relationships, etc. And so, 85% of core brain development is done by the age of three, so that's 36 months, uh, and 95 by the time they're five. And so, most of the gray matter, most of your circuitry is already established. You're already born with 100 over 100 billion neurons, so those are brain cells. And in the first three years of life, um, those are firing to connect. So those early experiences, that brain uh, architecture is being formed by connections. And what you want is to strengthen 
those uh, connections uh, between neurons that are skills that you want to um, strengthen. And so that's language, so you'll see the first um, graphic here, and these are all from the Center of Developing Child at Harvard. They have lots of really neat videos that kind of show, uh, I think it's actually called brain architecture. So if you Google that, you can see you know, how they kind of link and show an image of these, of these neurons connecting and firing away. And so these things are all so connected. So you, you wouldn't be able to develop language without first developing these sensory pathways, vision, hearing, things like that. So what you want to see happening is you can't just focus on um, one area of the brain. You can't focus on developing just certain skills of the brain. That's not how we work. Um, humans don't develop that way. Um, and so by the first year of life, you have peak development in these three areas, so sensory, language, and then higher cognitive functioning, which is um, the front part of your brain. So I kind of describe, a lot of people have different metaphors, but your brain develops um, like a flower. So you have your brain stem, which is your limbic system, and that stuff controls uh, heart rate, blood pressure, things that you need that otherwise, um, unless something goes really wrong at birth, you have already. You have these functions already in your system. And then you get into the middle part of your brain, and that's your emotional part of your brain. And you need that, that part for multiple things. You need it for developing secure attachments. Um, it also is your flight fight response system of your brain. And then the last thing to bloom is your prefrontal cortex. And that is your decision making rational. This is where the executive, all of the pre early um, preschool readiness language around executive functioning, which is ability to regulate control of emotions, ability to plan, ability to anticipate consequences, all that stuff happens later. Um, and so what you need to do first is to establish the first few, uh, the most, the, the middle parts of your brain that are really around making sure that those neurons that are responsible for the emotional piece are able to express themselves emotionally, or a child is able to express themselves emotionally in healthy ways that um, then allow for those higher cognitive skills to be layered on on top of that. And so um, we know, and all of this also comes down to brain plasticity. So in the early childhood world, we really like to be champions for babies and toddlers. Um, and, but we don't, you know, we don't want to forget about older children because the brain is plastic throughout your lifetime. It just gets harder to change. Um, it takes more investment, takes more time. And so that's the second graph there is that, you know, once um, you have a much higher capacity for change in response to experiences, so a response to a new lesson, a new uh, experience is now going to be more readily wired into your brain at two or three years old than later in life. But that doesn't mean it can't change. It's just going to be much harder. Um, and so when we think about policies and practices that are two generation in this sense, so you're working on not only creating healthy brains early, but you're addressing any sort of emotional behavior challenges that the parents are facing, you're, you're, try, you're gonna have a lot more effort on the, on the side of the family. And so when we work with families and, and try to um, kind of communicate to the early childhood workforce about, you know, many of them get into the workforce because they really like kids. They don't really like grown-ups. Um, and so, but, but being there for the grown-up and having that grown-up really have um, the tools that they need to succeed to create an environment that is healthy and supportive and nurturing and responsive, um, that's important. So if you don't have that relationship with your child really early on, um, I don't know if you've ever tried to read to a child that doesn't know you. Has anybody tried doing that? Have you tried? How did it go? Um, yeah, they're like, what? Yeah, so part of the, and a lot of this is true too with some of the social determinants. So you have these um, factors, whether it's, or, or inputs that you're trying to address, but some of the mechanisms for accomplishing growth or the, uh, learning a new skill is about first having that healthy relationship with a caregiver. Um, and we now know this not through just the science, but that we have really good outcome data that says sensitive caregiving in those first few years of life predictive of later learning. Um, and so you have more academic success if you have that sort of nurturing. So that is just foundational across the board, uh, whether it's you're trying to um, read before bedtime, serve and return is a very common um, strategy that we use with families is just talking to your baby. Um, 
it's really important um, their experiences early on whatever they're feeling is even if they can't um, express it to you um, or maybe even um, you don't think they fully understand doesn't mean it doesn't matter so those early experiences really do matter um, I think that's all I have. Has, has technology played any factors in this like TV watching and, and cell phone constant cell phone mm -hmm. use of the little kids has have they done anything on that yet? So the, the jury's still out. I'll say that the AP and Fred Rogers Center says up for children under two, no screen time. Huh. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> they've lessened, they've lifted that up recently um, to okay if it's interactive. And so okay. if you're, let's say, with your toddler, and, and this is one of those things where this is, what the, this is what they say, but we know that if you're at a dinner party and you have to give your toddler phone, you have to give the toddler phone. It is just a precautionary, regu uh, not regular, it's a guideline so that um, the default isn't the phone, that the, the primary um, stimulation that they're getting isn't through technology. Um, there are visual and comprehension issues, so there's been lots of kind of um, work done to see, you know, if you're in a, if a child's looking at a parent, let's say if you're in a room, and I, this was a while ago, so I don't remember the actual study, but if we're in a room like this, and a child is here, and there's a box, and I bring a teddy bear in, and I throw the teddy bear in the box, and I walk away, and I'm like, where's the teddy bear? The child is more, is going to be likely able to say it's right there, most of the time. Mm -hmm. If you do the same exercise through a screen, and you ask the child where the teddy bear is, it doesn't happen in the same way. So they're not likely to recognize through the screen that there was an extra, an actual um, thing. And this is just for very young children, so this okay. is children under three. Um, what is more damaging, and we're actually learning more about, is actually parent use of cell phone. And so uh, we're learning that, that parents' uh, lack of attention to their child and concentration on their own cell phone versus their child may have really severe consequences on not only um, that building of the relationship, which is the foundational piece, but then the skills that are going to be built up on top of that. Um, similar to how stress takes away from that opportunity to connect, your phone takes away from the opportunity to connect. So that's actually what we're more worried about okay. than a hard and fast, don't give your child the phone. Because um, you know, sometimes you just gotta, don't quote yeah, me on that. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Um, yeah, and I think when we talk about, you know, creating these nurturing environments, um, you know, we start with the, the infant and then we look at the family. And often we stop kind of there when we talk about creating nurturing environments for um, infants and, you know, early in early childhood. But, you know, we're really trying to expand the conversation too to how do those community environments impact the, the child through the family and through the through the individual that's like from the early from the child to the the community environment so what I mean by that is um, you know often we'll say oh the parent isn't providing enough stimulation or you know enough support to the child but when we kind of take that step back and another layer back it's kind of like well why is it that the parent isn't able to do that um, what's going on in their lives? What's going on in the community environment? Um, you know, are there high rates of violence? Are there lack of jobs? Um, are they facing some of the Alice uh, data that we've been seeing? Mm -hmm. Are they struggling in other ways? And so, Margaret, I would love to hear um, how you're thinking about things like Alice in the context of the impact on young children and families a little bit more. So um, on the cell phone thing, I've constantly been amazed how people can be on it all the time. And I've been trying to figure out what are they doing? It's Facebook and Instagram and all that other stuff. So a parent, let's say turn it off because it's too addicting to keep looking at what's popping up versus paying attention to your children. I'm lucky enough to be too old to care that much about any of that and really don't want my life splattered across the internet. <laughs> So that's just an aside, Margaret Ozer's advice on that. <laughs> um, in terms of where uh, we see the challenges for families, first and foremost, cost of quality care. Um, most families are having to make those hard choices. If they can afford quality care, what else are they having to give up to be able to do that? 
Quality care is fantastic if you can find it. And there are low cost quality care centers all over. But it's sometimes can't get in because it's full or sometimes it's not accessible because it's not close enough or direct enough for you, particularly if you're on public transportation. So they're choosing between family and friends, which are great, but they can also get sick or have to deal with something in their own family. So it may not be as reliable. Um, or they're dealing with care that's only during the hours of seven to six. And they have a job that's nine to three in the morning or something like that. So it's those kinds of choices families have to make. Housing's another big choice people have to make. Do we spend more on housing so we can be closer to the schools we want our kids to go into, closer to work, those other things? Or do we spend less so that we can provide the other things the family needs, but then we're in substandard housing, um, which can bring health risks to it. It's not near the schools that are gonna be the best for our children and those kinds of consequences. Transportation. We all want, most of us want a nice car, but quite frankly, we're just happy if we get in the car in the morning and it starts, right? We don't really think about it till that morning you get in and it doesn't do anything. And then it throws your entire day off. Well, we've all been in the part of our lives where you go in that car and you're like, well, I don't have the money to get this fixed. How am I gonna get back and forth to work today? And then what am I gonna do the rest of the week or the rest of the month till I can afford to get whatever's wrong with my car fixed? Worse, if your car has a blowout on the street on the way to work. So those kinds of choices that you're dealing with. You gotta get a better car, but then you're paying more in a note. Or you keep the clunker and just pray every morning it's gonna get you where you need to go. Um, food, food's a huge struggle for families. The cheaper way is not the healthy way. We, we all know that. What you can get cheap, is not. it'll keep you alive, it will not keep you healthy. It's not gonna get you the fresh fruits and vegetables that you need every single day. It's not gonna get you the lean protein you need every single day. It's gonna get you lots of chips, lots of dips, and lots of box prepared foods. So looking at ways that we can do more co-op type of foods or, family, or farmer markets that are in the community that people can afford, ways to get this to families so they don't have to choose every single month whether to feed my family healthy or just keep them fed. Um, healthcare, it's a huge one. For a lot of families, they might be able to stay on Medicaid and keep it there depending on their income for their child till they're 13. Then after 13, it starts weighing down in the state of Texas. But parents tend to not do anything for themselves. So what happens? The parent gets sick, then they have to miss work, and then they can't do what they need to do for their child. It's a, it's a downward slope. Healthcare is just as important for the parent as it is for the child. And I personally believe that's a policy issue we need to address in the state and in this country. Um, I'm sure there are other choices that people are making every single day, but those are the primary ones that every single choice you make has an impact. The last one I want to say is employment. So a lot of your higher paying jobs are going to be shift work. And the higher wage is going to be overnight. And I'm sorry? Which is not the best for your health either. Exactly. Your health or caring for your family. So I, I know a few who've tried to do overnight daycare, but if, for whatever reason, it's hard to keep those going. So you've got to find alternate means. So generally that means one parent's working during the day, one's working at night, and that's if you're lucky to be in a two-parent household. So the parents never see each other, so that causes its own stress. Or maybe not. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> you never know. But if you're a single parent and you're having to choose to work overnight, then you're having to make those choices of what, what do you do for your child overnight while you're at work. You take a lower paying job during the day, then those other consequences come into action. So every single day, families are having to make those tough choices. Thanks, Margaret. Um, is there a question related to what was just said? Yeah, go ahead. Okay, so um, how effective is the school breakfast, school lunch, school dinner, 
So the question was how effective are the school breakfast, lunch, backpack, all those supplemental feeding programs for children through the schools. And I would say they're very effective. For a large majority of those children, that's their warm meals and meal of the day. Um, the backpack program, I can just tell you my own experience when I was in San Antonio and some of the schools that we were working with, we started seeing kids stealing food Technically, we don't call it stealing, but they felt like it was because they were hiding it in their pockets. And when they were asked, why are you taking this food? It was for their younger siblings that weren't in school yet, that were still at home. So they would have something to eat. And the worst were the holiday breaks because there's nothing out there for kids. And that's when they really miss those meals. So they are highly effective. And I think more districts should go for the 100% just feed everybody because it also makes it hard on kids when they're singled out um, from other kids. And most districts these days can do 100% on the free meals. And I just want to put a plug back in for thinking about, you know, the but why, like, but why don't kids have food at home? Um, and what can we do to address the, the issues even more at its roots because um, I think that the food programs definitely have, you know are necessary and help people that are in need but also what can we be doing to support families um, so that they also have the the funds to be able to have food at home too um, and what kinds of policies strategies can be in place to support families um, overall um, and really get to the root of food insecurity. So um, we don't have too much time, and I want to make sure we have some discussion time too. So um, Christy, I'm wondering if you can, you know, we've started talking about the problem, the strengths in communities. We moved into the impact on early childhood and families. And now we kind of want to get to, um, you know, what kinds of strategies, policies can support well-being of families um, in relation to the types of things we've been talking about. So I referenced this a little earlier. Um, and I, if you want to just switch to the slide, there's this really great paper. Uh, there's a lot of really great papers, but this is one of my favorites um, that that the Center for the Developing Child recently published um, on three core principles of child development that practitioners and policymakers. So it's a, it's both. So practitioners, policymakers can use to improve outcomes for children and families, and those are supportive relationships, reducing sources of stress and strengthening core life skills. So it does a really great job. It's like, it's a few pages long, mostly images. I reread it last night, it's really simple. Um, but it, I really recommend it, and it really is, um, for lack of a better term, it's a way to sort of stress test any type of decisions, whether it's policy or programmatic, of do these things, um, are our goals addressing these things? So working to, um, you know, it, is whatever policy program service we're putting forward work to enhance supportive relationships or promote supportive relationships? Um, on the reverse, does the program service, you know, policy it hinder supportive relationships? Um, and so for every sort of type of program sector, um, goal, whatever you're working towards, so if you put it through these lenses, um, I think it it's really, could be really, really helpful and very generalizable, which is also really um, um, effective. So, for example, for relationships, you know, one of the things that, you know, we see a lot specifically in the child welfare system is, um, you know, there's an there's a overemphasis, not, you know, and, and not for any bad reason, but on safety and not on relationships. And so we have really frequent disruptions in care, um, both for the caretakers that are the primary caretakers, but also in childcare. And so, um, and then for older children's uh, potentially schooling, although there's there's laws on the books that help prevent those types of disruptions, sometimes it's not possible. Um, and so we have disruptions within that system, also for families that are working paycheck to paycheck, disruptions in their ability to. So there's certain, you know, um, childcare is really complicated because it's a market. They're incentivized, it's a private market, incentivized to be full and have a wait list. 
And so families routinely get kicked off, maybe because they missed too many days or missed a fee. Um, similar, and it's also very low paying uh, sector. So ch uh, child care workers get minimum wage, and so there's high turnover, so there's disruptions there. And children usually have between one and four primary attachment figures early in life. And a lot of times it is that child care worker. And if that worker leaves, then you have a disruption that can be really detrimental and you have to work to reestablish it. But most child care workers don't know how to do that. Um, and so how do you, how do you, how are you working towards these, avoiding these disruptions? So that's one way to think about the relationship piece. And just, it's relevant across the lifespan as well. Like humans are social animals. And so we need relationships to thrive. And some may even say to survive. Um, and so without those relationships, we won't be able to build resiliency. Um, and then what, what they mean by core skills is those executive functioning skills I was mentioning earlier. So the ability to regulate emotions, the ability to stay on task, to, um, to be able to manage your um, time and your, um, you know, kind of your activities of the day and things that we want to see in preschool. So a lot of those school readiness things that we want to see coming into school. Um, but we're also talking about that for adults. And so some of those core skills, the so self-regulation self executive function skills are much easier to build in little brain, not little brains, but in little people, because their brains are really plastic and are primed and ready to take it all in and get, get really strong in these skills. But for adults, you have to scaffold. You have to sort of see where they are. And you know, they, most parents want what's best for their children. And so a lot of times um, when they're not meeting their goals or not meeting their steps, it's, you know, it's why don't you want to help your child? It's no, it's they're doing the best they can and they're gonna only give what they have. You know, if, if we ask more than that, then it's not gonna, not gonna work. So if they're not able to um, make appointments and think, things like that, how can you scaffold your work with them so that um, you know, there's strategies that work for both of you and that they're building these skills over time and that you're giving them that space to practice these skills. They're not going to just be able to do it overnight. And the last is about, um, well not the last, but reducing sources of stress I talked about a little bit before. But I think um, in order to have a healthy stress response system, you have to build on these relationships. Um, and also the core life skills. So these are all interconnected. They're all two generation. And um, I'll just leave it at that because I know we're short on time. But the, I definitely recommend this paper for everybody. Great. Um, so yeah, I do want to make sure we get to questions um, from the audience. But um, Margaret, do you have any last words you want to share before we move into some Q&A and discussion? Sure. I'll just run through a list. Be really quick because we don't have a dog in the hunt yet on the policy, but here are some policies that could change people's lives. Change discussion from minimum wage to a living wage. Talk about subsidized child care for everyone. Part of the reason we pay our workers so low is because we can't afford to pay them what they are worth, and so we get what we get if it's not subsidized. Um, change the way we view public schools. I really worry that our public schools are on their last gasp, that um, as you look at their systems, they're struggling mightily, and if we don't do something soon, we're not going to have the free education we believe is critical to every person in our country. Um, other, and the last one is health care, and what do we do about health care in this country? Those are all big questions that no one's quite come up with the answer yet. But we've got to start having those hard conversations if we're going to move things forward. Thank you, Margaret. Um, so I just wanted to see if anyone has any questions. Yes. I have three questions. Well, I'll go really quick. First is yes or no. Was Alice done in San Antonio? Alice was done for the entire state of for the entire state of Texas. Okay. So you can look up the data on San Antonio. Okay. Next two questions come to the same lens. So I work for a high school um, and I we do a lot of coaching. Um, formally, uh, more informally, we want to go more formally. Um, so two things. Um, I'm wondering in your coaching program, right, that you mentioned in the first of this talk, do you ever, is there ever a goal or do you ever talk about encouraging 
families who are struggling financially or maybe young people that are struggling financially to find others like them and live together. That's literally how I survived and made it. And um, last year when my husband went back to work and I had our first child at 36 and thought I was super financially set, I had to ask my sister to move in with me. And luckily I could do that and we survived, right? Otherwise we would be in a horrible position. So I wonder if you, so I often coach, you know, look for people that you may be able to um, uh, live with that could support you, each other financially, but also in like-mindedness and achieving goals. I just wonder if that's ever a part of what um, you might coach somebody to do. Or is it only about like your your family needs to be financially independent? And does that kind of make sense? Mm. So the coach's role is really there to hear what the goals of the family are. And if the goals of the family is to find a way to live sustainably for a short period of time, they can offer them all kinds of options. But it's never to tell them which option to choose. Um, so I can't say specifically if they're given that option. It's up to that individual coaching relationship for that. I guess I wonder, like, is it from your standpoint, I know you mentioned like not telling people what they need to do, but finding out what their goals are. But would you like discourage that? Or would you say, you know, hey, this is a way that you could make it without government support or whatever. Like, I just wonder if that's just a, a, a positive way to approach when, when we're coaching young adult, high school and young adult age. So it's never our, as a coach, it's never their job to discourage what they're trying to do is to help them find the ways to make that happen and that they can make it happen. So again, I think it would depend on those individual coaches and their conversations if they're offering those options. I can't say for sure. And peer-to-peer -peer is always a great way to go about, you know, supporting each other. And, yeah. Yeah. And so then lastly, um, so for our teen parents um, and the language development that you talked about earlier, are, is there any resources that, that I could, uh, or someone that works with teen parents could read to coach them on, instead of just being like, you need to read a book, read a book to your kid. It's like, I mean, even break it down even more, like say, any tips to develop language um, that a teenager might have the capacity to do with their child that as a older parent or more secure parent might be, does yeah. that make sense? It, it all is the same. Right. Um, so the strategies are all the same, so that's the good news. The, the, the difference is, is that many times these children that are teen parents didn't have that modeling for them, right? right. And so, um, so I feel like a spokesperson for the Center for the Developing Child, but they just really, they actually just released a series of little vignettes that are um, modeling of uh, what it looks like to do the serve and return, which is the kind of the most basic thing. The serve and return in and of itself is like very mechanical. So underlying that again is that sensitive caregiving and that sensitive caregiving coupled with responsive attuned interactions creates the foundation for all learning. And so you really don't need a whole lot of tools and instructions, but modeling it is really going to be critical because those families that are now parents, those children that are now parents, you, I can pretty much guarantee they did not see that in their own families and any sort of even older adults that experience adverse childhood experiences may not have seen it, not all. And so what you want to see is increasing those interactions so that you're buffering against any current adversity that both the family, parent and child are facing. So a lot of modeling. Um, there are physical like activities. There's a really great app called Vroom. Vroom, V R Z zero. I said zero zero M. V R O O M. And um, it's free. It's an app, and um, and that's an another really great tool that actually gives them activities to do. That it's a much more tangible. But I still would do those with them in a modeling capacity because it is a written activity. And if you've never done these, if you've never gotten the floor and followed a child's lead. What is that? What does that look like? And it really simply is, you know, your infant or toddler is like, yeah. and you're like, what is that? What is that? That's awesome. And it's very, uh, but they don't, they've never done it before as children, they're not gonna know how to do it without some modeling. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, I wanna make sure that you all get to lunch on time, so I think we're gonna have to 
cut Q&A from here. But if you do have a quick question, maybe we can have the panelists stay up here and you can ask them. Let's give a round of applause for Christine Margaret. Thank you so much, you were both great. And I hope that you all can uh, take a look at the ALICE data, some of the Center for the Developing Brain, Ch Child, um, information as well, and continue to follow along for the Babies in Baytown uh, project that uh, Christy and uh, her collaborative are gonna be working on. And thank you.